Today, we're gonna to talk about how to taste coffee, how to break apart those sensations of taste, to understand what it is you like, what you don't like, and to begin to learn to describe what it is that we're tasting. Now this is a sort of second part, and the first part was how to set up a simple cupping at home. If you haven't watched that video yet, go and watch that video because setting up some sort of comparative tasting is absolutely essential to, to be able to develop your sense of taste and really progress quite quickly. Here I've got two different coffees, that's enough, but having three or four or five would be even better. Now, today's video is gonna be a lot of talking. I'm gonna to have to talk through a bunch of different taste characteristics. There's gonna be a bunch of opinion in there too, uh, but, but it's not a very practical video. I'm gonna taste some coffee, but I'm mostly, I'm gonna to talk to you. So the first thing I want you to do is check the description of this video. The first link is a link to a PDF, and that's PDF that is a kind of cupping form that I think is really helpful. Now this form was developed by Sarah Larson at Proofrock Training with a little help from Evelina at Proofrock and a tiny little bit of help from me too. There are loads of different cupping forms in our industry, but lots of them are focused on really specific things that aren't particularly relevant to what we're doing here. You can look at, say, the Cup of Excellence cupping form that is a complicated sheet that's really designed to help you rank an enormous number of raw coffees. A roaster may have a different form that they use to assess their roasts because they're not really looking at the raw coffee anymore, they're looking at the success of the roast. Here, this is a guide to help us sort of take notes and record what we like, what we don't, to better understand whether we like a coffee in front of us or whether we dislike it, what it is that we like, what it is that we don't like, that can help us choose better in the future, buy coffee better in the future, communicate with others what we like and what we don't like, and it's fun to develop your sense of taste. So what I'm gonna do is guide you through each of the sections, each of the categories of taste on the score sheet. And the first one is aroma, smell. How good does this coffee smell? Now, it's not really a key part of tasting, but it is a part of why we love coffee. When you grind a coffee, when you brew a coffee, there'll be a whole host of aromas that are delightful. Now, one of the key things about this sheet is the use of two individual scales, one for intensity and one for quality. You could have a coffee that smells incredibly strong and smells fantastic, that would score high on both fronts. You can have a coffee that, that doesn't smell that intense, but it does smell pleasant. Or you could have something that smells intensely awful. You'd wanna be able to record that uh, on, on two different scales, so that's why it's like that. A lot of coffee sheets just use one scale that I find a little bit confusing. Am I supposed to rate intensity or quality? Here, you've got two scales use them both. Now, aroma isn't the most important thing, but it is a huge part of why coffee's enjoyable, and if there are specific aromas that you catch, it's a good place to note them down. But don't worry too much if you can't put your finger on an exact aroma. Let's talk about acidity. Acidity is by far the most complicated, controversial, difficult, problematic aspect of coffee. Coffee professionals love acidity in coffee. Uh, and it happens for a whole host of reasons, and often it ends up being a little bit of a disconnect between them and a, a wider audience who maybe finds the idea of sour coffee to be unpleasant. Now, acidity is just one of the best parts of the food that we eat and drink. It provides that kind of freshness, that crispness to fruit. It, it gives that beautiful contrast to rich fattiness. It's a wonderful thing, but we don't think about it that much most of the time. Now, you'll perceive acidity around the sort of sides of your tongue. It's actually detected all over your tongue, but you sort of feel it along the sides there. And in coffee, it can be a really good thing or it can sometimes be a really bad thing because acidity, well, in English we have two words for it. We have acidity and we have sourness. And sourness has a kind of negative connotation. Acidity can be bad. Not many people enjoy drinking lemon juice. It's too sour, it's too acidic, but lemonade's fantastic, a good, sort of fresh, crisp green apple is fantastic acidity. If you like sour candy, you love acidity. It, it's a wonderful thing, but you want it to be a positive acidity, a fresh acidity. You want it to feel bright and crisp and fresh and not harsh and sour. So when you're assessing acidity, the easiest way to do that is back to comparative tasting. Does coffee A feel more acidic than coffee B? right, just a quantity assessment first. And then secondly, well, 
which acidity do I enjoy more? Which one feels nicer? Which one leaves my tongue feeling good? Which one maybe leaves it feeling a little sort of dried out? Which one's making me salivate? These are kind of nice ways to begin to assess acidity. One quick note, there is quite a common phenomenon in the general population, which is called bitter sour confusion, where a lot of people, uh, especially when tasting sour coffee, will describe it as bitter because it's unusual to most people to describe a coffee as sour. Uh, so sour bitter confusion is pretty normal. Again, if you're perceiving it strongly down the sides of the tongue, if it's causing a little bit of salivation, it's likely to be acidity. Now I've come across sour bitter confusion quite a lot uh, in my professional life. Typically it happens somewhere like a restaurant where a diner will send back an espresso for being too bitter. And that shot was definitely not over extracted. The machine is nice and clean. The roast is not dark. How is that a bitter shot? You kind of tear your hair out. Chances are it was just a very sour shot and there's bitter sour confusion at play uh, and that's the language that someone will reach for to describe what they don't like. Let's talk about sweetness. Now generally in our day-to-day -day lives when we talk about sweetness we're probably referring to a simple sugar or a sweetener designed to replicate the sweetness of a simple sugar. Something like sucrose which is table sugar or fructose found in fruit. That kind of very obvious, very sweet sweetness. Now there is no simple sugar in coffee. Coffee is not naturally sweet in that way at any point. You can tell this because if you take a cup of coffee and you add even the tiniest amount uh, of just table sugar to it, you can immediately tell that coffee is sweet in a whole other way. So here, when we talk about sweetness in coffee, it's, it's actually a much more complicated, more complex kind of definition of sweetness. You know what sweetness tastes like, I know what sweetness tastes like. And so for many people, when they taste coffee for the first time, they're like, well, that's not, that's not at all sweet. But sweetness in coffee tends to be this kind of slightly complicated composite of a whole host of different things. Acidity can add to sweetness in a funny way. It can kind of highlight that. It'll be about the kind of flavors and aromas that the coffee conjures. It'll be also about the kind of texture that the coffee gives. Sweetness generally comes from uh, ripe fruit when the coffee was grown and harvested. It comes from good processing and good roasting and ideally good brewing as well. So th there's no doubt that some coffees definitely feel sweeter than others, but don't go looking for a traditional obvious sweetness. It's a different kind of thing and it is much harder to quantify. But as you're back and forwards between coffees and you think about them, which one feels sweeter to you? Which one feels more complex, more more whole. So the next key characteristic of coffee that I want you to assess is body, right? And, and this is a, a kind of a funny word. We could use texture or mouthfeel. None of them are fantastic. And it's a really key characteristic of coffee that I feel is, is not really been embraced by the kind of modern specialty coffee movement. It feels like a classic kind of second wave thing to talk about texture, whereas we really just want to talk about flavor. But the texture, the mouthfeel, the body of a coffee, how it feels in your mouth is so important. You obviously could tell the difference between skim milk and whole milk, right? That there's a huge textural difference there. One feels thin, one feels rich and full. That's the kind of thing I want you to think about here. Is this coffee light and, and almost like tea or is it kind of heavy and full and rich and almost chewy? Like it's a very nice point to compare two different coffees. Like which one feels bigger, richer, fuller? Now you can have coffees that have a lot of mouthfeel, but you may not like that mouthfeel. At the most extreme end, um, Robusta as a species, that if you taste that, that will have a ton of body and texture, but it's not a particularly enjoyable one to me anyway. Some people certainly like it more than I do, and that's okay, but it, it's certainly one to consider. Now when it comes to assessing the sort of texture or the mouthfeel of a coffee, it's where I actually really prefer to use cupping as a brew method. If you say use a paper filter, that tends to sort of homogenize mouthfeel in quite a frustrating way. It's much harder to, to sort of discern between small differences in mouthfeel with paper filtered coffee. With a cupping where there's no filtration, light, delicate coffees still feel very light and delicate. Heavier, richer, fuller coffees definitely feel that way too. So, that's why I'm a big fan of the cupping method to help develop language around coffee tasting. So the last category to talk about uh, on this section is finish. And that's really, what are you left with after swallowing that coffee, right? Like, does that feel good? Does that feel bad? Is it a harsh, unpleasant finish? Do 
a whole bunch of pleasant flavors slowly develop and, and sort of build over time. What are you left with? Is it a nice taste or a bad taste? Do you like the aftertaste or not? Right? Some coffees will almost disappear. Right? You'll swallow and you'll be left with really kind of nothing there. That would be scoring low on both quantity and, for me, on quality as well. There might be a brief finish where it's lovely for a second but then goes away. It's quite a tricky thing to do uh, if you're tasting multiple coffees. It needs a little bit of patience because you constantly want to go back and compare and contrast. So take your time here. You can taste coffees all the way down until they're pretty much room temperature, so there's no rush here. You've got at least 30 minutes to do so, but don't keep bouncing backwards and forwards when you want to score this. Taste it, let it sit, 30 seconds a minute, and really decide how you feel. There's one more category left that I want to talk about, which is flavor, but before that, I just need to tell you about this video's sponsor. Skillshare is an online community full of thousands of classes covering all sorts of different entrepreneurial and creative skills. Now, I'm a Skillshare Premium member, which costs me $10 a month, and it means I have unlimited access to all of the classes they have to offer. For me, that's hugely useful. I want to learn about things that are relevant to my career, relevant to YouTube, to making better videos, and there's tons of information on filmmaking on there. At the same time, there's lots of other things that really just interest me that are just fun to learn about. I love being able to dip into, say, a quick knife skills class and pick up one or two things to take into my everyday cooking. I think Skillshare is incredibly affordable, but if you want to try it out, then use the link in my description down below. You can get two months of free Skillshare Premium, unlimited access to all the courses that they offer. Imagine what new skills you could acquire in the next 60 days. Now, flavor is undeniably the category that gets people the most excited because being able to accurately describe the flavors of coffee makes you feel like a pro. The description of flavor amongst professionals can easily get frustratingly competitive. People are trying to call out the most specific descriptor they can, and I don't think that's particularly helpful. I would say that there's a few key kind of uh, groups of flavors that are worth paying attention to that will help you understand what you like and what you don't like. Now, there are flavor wheels out there to help you narrow down your, your descriptors to something quite precise, but I, I don't want you to feel like you have to use a precise descriptor for it to be accurate. I, I get quite frustrated by our industry's obsession with very specific descriptors that are reliant on whoever is tasting that coffee having the same water brewing the same way from the same batch that they tasted. Coffee is a moving target, and I think very specific descriptors are probably intimidating to some people, frustrating to others, pretentious to others still. So let's just talk about some broad characteristics. So let's talk about a kind of the fruity category of flavor descriptors that people use. Now this is just a personal theory thing, but I would say there are broadly speaking three categories of kind of fruit descriptors that you'll see in coffee. At one end, you might see those kind of fresh fruit descriptors that cover things like berries, things like stone fruits, things like apples or pears. And then in the middle, you might have what I might call the kind of cooked fruit characteristics, things that are like jammy, things that are like kind of baked kind of pies or that kind of stuff. You'll see people refer to sort of cooked fruits sometimes. And then on the other end, there are those kind of tropical through to kind of fermented fruit flavors that are really quite different to all of the others that we've talked about beforehand. For me, these are kind of tied to acidity. If you have a, a, a sort of medium to high level of acidity in a coffee, you're probably going to want to start hunting around for a fresh fruit descriptor. That's the time in the real world where we get high sweetness, high acidity is in fresh fruits, and that's what your brain is probably thinking about something in that category. Is it berry-like? Is it grape-like? Is it kind of apple-y and fresh and crisp that way? Or is it maybe more like a plum or a peach or something, that kind of sweet acidic combo there? If the coffee has a little bit lower acidity, then yeah, I, I would generally look for um, more of a kind of cooked fruit descriptor. I think those are really helpful sometimes. Generally, when you cook fruits down, you do diminish their acidity, which is why if you're getting that kind of aroma and flavor of fruit, but you want to describe it well, I think, I think cooked fruits are a good place to go. On the other end, you've then got categories like kind of uh, tropical fruits or, or, or sort of slightly fermented wild kind of things there. It can cover things like strawberries, even though that really should sit right in this end, but that kind of aroma 
aroma of strawberries is often common in things like naturally processed coffees, or you might have coffees that have had a much longer fermentation that's kind of skirted things getting a little too wild, and you might you know, use descriptors like mango or pineapple for those kind of coffees. Generally speaking, this category of flavor is a little bit of a love-hate thing with both uh, consumers and professionals. You know, some people really love naturally processed coffees that have these kind of characteristics. Some people really, really, really hate them. Now there is one category of flavor that if I was being fancy, I would call the kind of Maillard and caramelization uh, family of flavors. If I'm being less fancy, I would say it's the things that have gone brown and are now delicious category. This would include things like kind of caramels or chocolate or toast or biscuits or things that got baked, things that have been roasted in a, in a delicious and kind of sweet way. Coffee undergoes a whole host of very similar reactions to other things that are roasted or baked. And so using those kind of words, I think are very good descriptions of, of coffee. Typically, you might wanna be trying to describe the particular kind of sweetness that a coffee has, right? Is it more like a kind of maple syrup? Is it more like a caramel? Is it more like a toffee? Do people know the difference between toffee and caramel anyway? Who knows? I don't want you to be really specific in this stuff. It, it isn't helpful because you'll end up chasing a thing. If one specific word pops into the back of your brain, write it down, keep it, grab it. It's really useful when that happens, but don't feel you have to get that specific for every single thing. Now, it's perfectly acceptable to write down descriptors for things that you don't like here as well. If there is a bitterness that you don't like, if there's a burntness that you don't like, if there's a kind of rubbery flavor that you don't like, if it tastes like earth or wood or mushrooms or vinegar or just something unpleasant, it's okay to pay attention to the things that you don't like as much as the things that you do like. Now on this little score sheet, there is at the end a place for a score. Now I'm not a huge fan of scores in general, but it is a nice place to kind of summarize how you feel about a particular coffee, right? Like it, just give it an emotional score. I think that's okay. In coffee, we score in a much more structured way where there's lots of different categories contribute uh, scores to a final score. Those are useful for some people, they're a little problematic for others. Here, I just want you to, to have somewhere to make a note of your favorites for the things you didn't really care for and for the things in between. So I did just want to touch on one final characteristic that isn't really discussed in typical coffee tastings or, or coffee scoring sheets. That's bitterness. Now, as an industry, we're not very comfortable talking about bitterness because to us, Bitterness is failure. We think that one of the key sort of selling points of specialty coffee is that it is much, much, much less bitter than commodity coffee, than commercial coffee. But there's still some bitterness there, right? There, there are undeniably bitter compounds in every single cup of coffee, and it's okay if you wanna talk about that. It's okay if you like that. For us, bitterness is kind of a failure. It's a failure of roasting, it's a failure of brewing. We don't really wanna talk about it even if you like it. And I'll be honest, it's true for me. If I'm doing a public tasting, I really won't talk about bitterness until someone raises the question. But it, it's okay if you like it, it's okay if you wanna take notes about it. I just wanted to explain why as an industry we don't really talk about it. So go, go and taste, go and compare and contrast. Take a bunch of notes. Don't settle on anything until you've had a chance to taste it right the way down until it's cool. You're gonna change your mind about how you feel several times in the course of one tasting. That's totally normal. Now I don't say this very much, uh, but do please make sure you're subscribed because there is something very fun, very silly, very big, very cool coming very soon and I don't want you to miss out. So, so if you can, please subscribe. I'll just say thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.